then uh, in our Bibles, we'll continue on with Daniel. I'm really enjoying uh, our look at Daniel, and so we'll continue on in Daniel chapter 2 and actually read into chapter 3. We'll start at verse 46 of chapter 2 and read through uh, chapter 3, verse 7. And I'll give you a little setup here because a lot has happened that uh, is somewhat important. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, has had this dream and it was troubling him. He's got this kingdom that he's proud of and that he's worried about. And uh, this dream had something to do with the kingdom. And he asked his, all his wise men if they could interpret it. But first they had to tell him what it was and then interpret it. And they couldn't uh, do any either. Uh, so he was going to have them all killed. And, uh, and among those, uh, Daniel kind of got caught in the mix, Daniel and his friends. Uh, and so they were going to be killed. But then Daniel said, wait, let me talk to the king. And, and Daniel was able to interpret uh, this dream. He, he knew what it was and he was able to interpret it and it, it was this this image and uh, it was a head of gold and then it went down silver and bronze and iron and then clay and iron mixed as it went from top to bottom and and it had to do with his kingdom and kingdoms that would come but he, he figured out this dream and uh, Nebuchadnezzar uh, now is going to respond uh, to what Daniel said. Daniel uh, as he was talking, he mentioned um, that the dream is certain and its interpretation is sure. That's how uh, we ended in verse 45 of chapter 2. And so now we'll continue uh, with uh, the reaction of King Nebuchadnezzar to Daniel's ability to interpret this dream. Then King Nebuchadnezzar fell upon his face and paid homage to Daniel and commanded that an offering and incense be offered up to him. The king answered and said to Daniel, Truly, your God is God of gods and Lord of kings and a revealer of mysteries, for you have been able to reveal this mystery. Then the king gave Daniel high honors and many great gifts and made him ruler over the whole province of Babylon and chief prefect over all the wise men of Babylon. Daniel made a request of the king, and he appointed Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego over the affairs of the province of Babylon. But Daniel remained at the king's court. King Nebuchadnezzar made an image of gold, whose height was 60 cubits high and its breadth 6 cubits. He set it up on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon, then King Nebuchadnezzar sent to gather the satraps, the prefects, and the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the justices, the magistrates, and all the officials of the provinces to come to the dedication of the image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Then the satraps, the prefects, and the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the justices, the magistrates, and all the officials of the provinces gathered for the dedication of the image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up, and they stood before the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. And the herald proclaimed aloud, You are commanded, O peoples, nations, and languages, that when you hear the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, bagpipe, and every kind of music, you are to fall down and worship the golden image that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. And whoever does not fall down and worship shall immediately be cast into a burning, fiery furnace. Therefore, as soon as all the peoples heard the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, bagpipe, and every kind of music, all the peoples, nations, and languages fell down and worshipped the golden image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. The word of the Lord. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do give you thanks for your word, and we pray that as we look at it, your truth will shout loudly in our hearts, that we can grow in, your, in the knowledge of you, Lord, that you will guide us. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Have you ever had that? Thing happen 
and I know we all have, where you think somebody's got it. You know, you're talking about something or you're trying to explain something and you think they have it and then you leave and you find out they didn't know what I was talking about or maybe they're just being obstinate. Uh, sometimes it's actually a little humorous when it happens. Uh, when you, a child is, has his color crayons and he's writing on the wall and then you tell him, you, you can't write on this wall. Here's some paper, write on the paper, just don't write on this wall. And then you go away and you come back a few minutes later and he's across the room writing on the wall. And you said, I told you not to write on the wall. And then he'll say, no, you said not to write on that wall. All right, you win this argument. Or, or maybe sometimes uh, you're just reading things differently. Uh, this is football season. We see this a lot in football season. A quarterback goes back to pass, and, and he throws the ball, and the receiver's running the other way. Uh, he zigged when the quarterback thought he was going to zag, and, and then the quarterback always gets this angry face and kind of does this thing like, you know, he made the wrong read. They, they weren't on the same page. Uh, we, we see that a lot. Uh, and sometimes it's, it's sad. Um, and just a result of human weakness. Uh, when I was doing jail ministry, uh, and, and I did that pretty regularly for a while, and uh, where I was at, and this might be uh, all over the United States, I don't know, but where I was at, uh, they would be in jail if their sentence was less than a year. If it was a year or more, they had to go to prison, but they would stay in jail if it was less than a year or if they were waiting uh, for trial. And we did some prison ministry, but I remember jail particularly. You, there would be a, a person there, and maybe he had a nine-month sentence. And so he would come to the Bible study, and, and, and I did it pretty regularly, and so I would get to know them. And, and nine months, and, and he's gone, and you're happy, and, and he seems like he really has it. And then a couple months later, he's sitting in your Bible study, and you think, what, what happened, man? I thought you were, I thought you had it. And usually they'd kind of shrug their shoulders and say, I thought I did too. But I messed up. And here I am. It happens in various ways. Sometimes you just don't get it. Sometimes you're on the wrong page. Sometimes it's just weakness. And there's sometimes where you just like to say, like with the child on the wall or with this, this, uh, uh, guy in jail, you, don't, you just like to be with him every minute. Can I, can I just be with you every minute so you don't do the wrong thing? You know, so that, so that I make sure you have it. Well, when we look at Nebuchadnezzar, we see a guy here that looks almost like he has it, but then find out he doesn't have it at all. And in fact, he's gotten worse. He shows us weakness, even though he's king of Babylon. He hears what Daniel has to say. Daniel's able to interpret this dream. Tell him what the dream is and interpret it. And, and he gives this kind of odd response when you really look at it. He falls upon his face and pays homage to Daniel. Now, he's extremely happy. And I don't know if he's as happy as he is just relieved. This dream had been giving him problems. And, and so... He was losing sleep, and nobody was able to answer this, but now he's got the answer, and so you can imagine there's great relief, and we know that feeling. Sometimes we want to know. Even if it's bad news, I'd rather know than not know. Uh, it's the unknown that can, can sometimes be troubling, and Nebuchadnezzar now is, is happy. He's relieved. He's got an answer. The dream isn't perfect, by the way. Uh, an inferior kingdom is going to take over his. That's part of the interpretation. But it does have its moments. Uh, the head was gold, and, and he's the golden head. So it, it does have his moments. He's, he's golden boy in this one. But, but there are some issues with the dream for Nebuchadnezzar. It's not absolutely perfect, but, but this, this response is, is strange and even contradictory when you look at it. Because he falls on his face and and commands that offering and incense be offered up to Daniel. 
there's this very worshipful attitude towards Daniel, even though Daniel could not have been more clear. When you look back at chapter 2 and uh, verse uh, 27, uh, how no king um, can, or no person can answer what the king is trying to do, but then in verse 28, but there is a God who reveals mysteries. And then in verse uh, 30, Daniel says, it's, uh, I've revealed this to you, not because of any wisdom that I have, uh, but then in order that you might know, and it's this God who has told us this, a God, one God. And Nebuchadnezzar is polytheistic, but Daniel could not have been more clear. There is a God who revealed this to me, not because I'm anything special, but just so that you know. Now, as I mentioned, Nebuchadnezzar is, is polytheistic by profession, but still we can see through that he wants to be God. He's still trying for that. And he gives this weird response of a worshipful attitude to Daniel, but he seems to say the right thing. Then do you notice that? He, he says... To Daniel, truly, your God is God of gods and Lord of kings and a revealer of mysteries, for you have been able to reveal this mystery. So it seems like he almost has it. Daniel's God is the God. But when Nebuchadnezzar uses the term God of gods, he doesn't use it as, say, the psalmist does. When the psalmist uses the word or that phrase, God of gods, He's almost mocking the pagan gods. But, but Nebuchadnezzar, we can see his true colors. He's not really giving up his polytheism here. He's not really giving up the idea that there are, in his mind, other gods. He's thankful for what Daniel has been able to do, and I don't doubt that at all. He's awed by what Daniel is able to do to tell him this dream and then interpret the dream. And, and he's very happy about this. But it would be a stretch to say that he was converted. He's had a moment here, but he's not getting it yet. And then he gives Daniel these high honors and great gifts we see in verse 48, makes him ruler over the whole province of, of Babylon. This is working out wonderful, uh, wonderfully for Daniel and his friends. And Daniel, uh, when you remember, he was under a death sentence, actually, when this started. Uh, the, the guy, the guard that was killing the wise men, he came in to kill Daniel when this uh, started. And, and now Daniel gets this this great position, ruler over the whole province of Babylon. And he makes this request that his friends uh, get promoted too. But notice that he's ruler over all the wise men. And you think, what are the wise men still hanging around for? Why does Nebuchadnezzar still have these guys hanging around? They couldn't do what he asked him to do. They, he said, interpret the dream, tell me the dream, and interpret it. They couldn't do that. Um, he was furious with them. He actually wanted to kill them. And there was a sense when we were looking at that that he didn't even really trust them completely. Because at one point they told him, you tell us the dream and then we'll tell you the interpretation. He said, I know what you're doing. You're trying to buy time. And you're just going to tell me what you think I want to hear. So you tell me the dream. It, there's always the sense that he didn't, didn't really trust them anyhow. So why are they hanging around? Now, I think maybe the answer to that question is we have to remember that Nebuchadnezzar is a vain man. And vain men love yes men around them. And these guys are yes men. And they'll do whatever they can to the best of their ability. And maybe Nebuchadnezzar had, has come to realize, you know what, they just really couldn't do that. Only Daniel could. But to the best of their ability, 
he can ask them to do pretty much anything and they will do it. And of course, egomaniacs like that kind of thing. But we can see the flaw in the system here. Even if we don't know the rest of the story, and, and it will come up, but, but we can see the flaw in Nebuchadnezzar's system here. Here he's setting up Daniel and his three friends, and you have to wonder, well, how are these wise men going to respond to them? Here are these Jewish youths, and all of a sudden they get promoted, and this is going to cause some problems down the line. You can see this coming, but in Nebuchadnezzar's mind, in his ego and in his pride, he doesn't see this one coming yet. But Nebuchadnezzar uh, gives Daniel and his friends this, this promotion. And if, if you left the story right now, you could be tempted to think, you know, Nebuchadnezzar's on the right path. He's, he's got this moment here of knowing that Daniel's God is, is the God of gods, at least. He's, he's, he's heading down the right road, isn't he? I'm excited to see where he goes. We'll leave him alone for a little while and then see what happens. Uh, but one thing, Daniel, or one thing Nebuchadnezzar does not do is we don't see that he seeks counsel from Daniel then. Uh, between chapters 2 and chapter 3, there is probably some period of time uh, some speculate that it could have been a number of years between chapter 2 and, and chapter 3, and, and it doesn't really matter. Uh, in fact, if time has passed, that, that is part of the story here, because Nebuchadnezzar is going to go back to his old habits. You know, he had this moment, but then he didn't keep seeking Daniel's counsel. We don't see that anywhere here. He just kind of left. Daniel, you get a raise, you get a promotion, and then he's back to doing his old things. And then later on, at some point down the road, we get to chapter 3, and he's building this image of gold. Height, 60 cubits, and its breadth, 6 cubits. Now, uh, from nation to nation, the cubit would kind of vary a little bit, but uh, if we stick with 18 to 20 inches, and, and that's generally what they were, somewhere in that range. We have an image here that is 90 feet tall, 9 feet wide, and made of gold. And he sets it up in this plane so that in the sunlight there will be this brilliant sunlight shining off this golden image that Nebuchadnezzar has set up. And by the way, I don't know if you noticed the repetition uh, of Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Uh, Daniel writes that at least six times in some form or another in these seven verses, uh, first seven verses of chapter three. Daniel's very clear, this is all Nebuchadnezzar. He's the guy that's setting this up. This is his idea. This is all about him. And it's this image, and it seems very similar uh, to the image that Nebuchadnezzar saw in his dream with one major difference. This one's all gold. The image in his dream had the gold and silver and bronze and iron and clay this one is all gold, 90 feet tall worth of gold. And in Nebuchadnezzar's mind and the message he's sending to everyone, worth every ounce of gold there is. And there also seems to be this real rejection of the dream and its interpretation. He's going to build this image that represents his kingdom is never going to end. It's all gold. The gold doesn't end. Even though Daniel had told him in chapter 2, verse 45, the dream is certain. The interpretation is sure. But yet Nebuchadnezzar, he commissions uh, this idol. And it really symbolizes his desire that no kingdom is going to destroy his not even God, not even the God of Daniel, he's really slipped. And notice he does something underhanded here. 
in verse 2, he has all these big wigs come to the dedication of the image. That's how it starts, a dedication to the image. But yet, when we get to verse 5, uh, it says they're to fall down and worship this golden image. A little underhanded there. Invites them to a dedication, ends up as a worship service. And everyone has to bow down and worship this whenever they hear the sound of all of this music that starts. And people are discouragingly impressed by pomp and prestige and numbers. And here's this great, shiny, golden image in the middle of this plain. And, and we've got all the bigwigs in town. And so when the music starts, they, they bow down and they worship. But also there's this command that he gives in verse 6. Whoever does not fall down and worship shall immediately be cast into a burning, fiery furnace. And we can see that what happened back in verse 49 of chapter 2 about Daniel and truly your God is God of gods. He experienced a religious conviction, but without a spiritual conversion. He had a religious moment, but there was no conversion in it. In uh, Sinclair Ferguson, he writes this, In fact, he had experienced only a superficial and temporary setback to his self-glorification. His sinful heart had been shaken, but not removed. And we notice that he's even worse. The state of sin has gotten worse than before. Earlier, he was certainly pagan, polytheistic. And then there came that point where he wanted to kill the wise men because they couldn't interpret this dream. But now, look how far he's gone. Now he's going to build an idol. And if you don't bow down to this then you're going to be thrown in the fiery furnace. He's just gotten worse and worse and worse. There was that moment of temporary thanksgiving, that moment of conviction, but he never pursued it. And now he's worse than he was before. Uh, the Puritan John Owen, uh, he, he writes, and, and I thought of Nebuchadnezzar uh, when I came across this. John Owen writes this, As a traveler in his way meeting with a violent storm of thunder and rain immediately turns out of his way to some house or tree for his shelter, but yet this causeth him not to give over his journey. So as soon as the storm is over, he returns to his way and progress again. So it is with man in bondage to sin. They are in a course of pursuing their lusts. The law meets them in a storm of thunder and lightning from heaven, terrifies and hinders them on their way. This turns them for a season out of their course. They will run to prayer or amendment of life for some shelter from the storm of wrath which is feared coming upon their consciences. But is their course stopped? Are their principles altered? Not at all. So soon as the storm is over so that they began to wear out that sense and the terror that was upon them, they return to their former course and in the service of sin again. And Nebuchadnezzar is showing us that. Our sins don't give up easily. They'll keep pursuing. There may be moments of conviction. And those are the moments that we turn into conversion. The moments that we, we understand who God 
he is. This is one of those times where you've been like, you'd have liked to have been by Nebuchadnezzar and say, Nebuchadnezzar, go to Daniel. Spend every minute with Daniel. Learn from Daniel. He'll get you back on the right course. He'll tell you about this God. And he shows us this weakness of not seeking the counsel of God. One of the great emphasis that Jesus gave his disciples in that last night of his earthly life when he was in the upper room, he told his disciples of the Holy Spirit. He said, I'm going away, but the Holy Spirit will be with you. In fact, Jesus said, and I quote, he will guide you into all the truth. He'll bring to mind Christ and what he's done. The next day, Christ would hang on a cross and die for our sins. He would rise in victory, and then he would ascend into heaven, the risen, victorious God in heaven. But that promise of the Holy Spirit came true. And the Holy Spirit is with us. And the Holy Spirit will convict us. But the Holy Spirit will bring us back to Christ. Because sometimes we can be like the child writing on the wall and then just completely misunderstand, God, I thought you meant that wall. Sometimes we zig when God wanted us to zag. Sometimes it's the weakness of our flesh that will trip us up. But here's the encouragement in all of this. God is with us every minute. And if we seek his counsel, he'll direct us to him for our good and for his glory. And on Monday morning when we pray, all the way through Sunday evening when we pray, we seek the Holy Spirit, who Christ promises is with us. Because we know we misinterpret things. We know we run the wrong direction at times. We know we're weak. But Christ in his death and resurrection is quick to forgive. His Holy Spirit is quick to lead. Let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we do thank you for great words that you give us, words of comfort. We know we could be as weak as Nebuchadnezzar and be as bad as we could possibly get, if not for your leading, Lord for you being with us each and every minute. May we look to you at all times, in all things, and walk in your ways. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. And then uh, we'll turn to, where am I here? Uh, Hymn 334, and I guess sing the whole song.